Questions abound on the internet about what you should be doing when it comes to rowing, and today we're answering the internet's most common questions posed by you through a poll on our channel. So make sure that in the future you guys are subscribed to the channel so that if you have questions, you might just get them answered. So today I wanted to actually connect with you guys and answer real questions that you have. There are so many questions that can be asked when it comes to rowing, and it's really hard to know where to start, but these questions asked by you are very intelligent. It's from people who have probably tuned in here at one point or another, and are looking for answers that may go a little bit deeper than some of our other videos. So if you're looking to have those questions, those burning questions answered about what to do, with rowing, that's what we're doing. And if this is your first time here, welcome. I'm Shane Farmer. This is Dark Horse Rowing, where you build the life that you want to live, and we just happen to use rowing usually to get you there. Okay, so let's just kick into the questions and start answering them for you. First question comes from Jessica Babin. Why do my heels lift up a little bit as I come forward on the rower? Am I reaching too far? Thanks. Also, shout out from Australia. Love your videos. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. In all honesty though, your heels lift a little bit as you come forward on the rower because it's a very normal response to the body starting to build compression on the way up. The heels lifting is a slight way to release some of that tension or pressure that's building up. Am I reaching too far? That one I can't tell without actually seeing you move. But let me clarify that on the channel, you often hear me coaching heels down, but when you see me moving, I lift my heels a little. Why do I teach heels down and is it wrong to lift the heels? Number one, no, it's not wrong to lift the heels and that's actually very normal rowing mechanics. Why do we teach heels down? Because when the heels lift as a beginner and as you start to get used to the rowing machine, the heels lifting creates a host of downstream problems that we then have to undo if you allow the heels to lift immediately. So we teach heels down because when the heel is down, that helps you learn how do I press through my whole foot on the drive, as well as it typically puts your hips and the seat in the right position at the catch, which is hips behind the shoulders and the trunk at a forward angle of one o'clock. If the hips slide underneath the shoulders at any point at the catch position, if you're at 12 o'clock, you're in the wrong position. And so when the heels stay down, it forces more compression out of the body and it doesn't typically allow the seat to slide forward almost ramming into the heels instead it kind of keeps you in this a position at the catcher ideally you want your shins vertical once you isolate those mechanics once you get good with keeping the heel down understanding where your body should be at the catch then you can begin to flash the heel a little bit you can add maybe two inches of heel lift because now you're going to understand that if the heel lifts, I know how to press the heel down. I know how to roll onto pressure and push through the entire foot. So that's the answer there. Am I reaching too far? That one I can't tell you, but your heels lift because it's normal. So just isolate whether or not you're doing it intentionally or if it's because it creates a lot of pressure and you're trying to get into just a deeper position for the sake of just length, right? You don't wanna get long at all costs, you wanna get long with good position. All right, the second question from Food for Thought. Is it okay for me to row one hour per day, six days a week? Same speed and intensity, it's better than nothing, right? Yeah, right. I would absolutely argue that that is better than nothing, and I would have no reason to really say that no, that's not a, a good way of going about it. You get a rest day in, an hour per day is a good amount of activity. As long as the intensity is fine, that your body is recovering well, and you know that you can keep up six days a week with one day of rest, I think that's okay. Could it be improved though? I would say yes, we could improve a program like that. I would add in an extra rest day, and on some of those other days of training, I would add in a different variety of performance, even if all we're using is the rowing machine. So. Same speed and intensity, I would change that. I would change speed and I would change intensity. I would change duration. I would change rest periods. I'd alter all sorts of things in a program so that you do a three on, one off, two on, one off program, getting five days a week accumulated, but that you increase intensity in some, decrease it in others, because what's that, what that's gonna give you is different metabolic effects on the back end, meaning your body is going to see general better health benefits because you're not just gonna settle in at like one consistent effort. So the body in turn becomes better trained and you find that you can overall improve general health instead of just in that one very narrow zone of that level of intensity, that speed, that time. Instead, you make your body a little bit more malleable and able to handle different events. There's the same reason that you wanna focus on both strength training and endurance, not one is better than the other. 
Same with this. It's not all sprinting. It's not all endurance. You want to create as much variety in your program as possible. Okay, next question is from, I believe I'm getting this name right, Seta Caffrey. I'm a new rower and feel like my 500 meter splits are so slow. In the mid twos, I'm a runner and think that I have fairly strong legs, but now my ego is taking a big hit with this new activity. Help. I think I really like the exercise and want to be good at it. Totally understand Seta. And it's also very understandable if you're a fit person from some other activity and you're coming to rowing that the ego is going to take a hit because often the, there's a disparity between your fitness here and what you're applying on the machine. At the end of the day, the answer almost always is gonna come back to the mechanics just haven't been sorted out with your brain and your body connecting on the machine, right? This thing requires that you place yourself in the right place at the right time, that you understand how the body is meant to interact with it. It doesn't guide you through the movement. And that's probably the, the hardest ego hit part is the having to take a step back that it's not just a thing that you jump on and just go to. You do have to take some time framing the mechanics so that your mind and body can now connect with the machine to actually give you tangible results of your fitness having the same level of output on this machine. End of the day, that's the simplest answer. Generally, take a step back, look at the mechanics for a while, of which there are plenty of videos on here you can take a look at, but use those to square yourself up, get your technique right, and I think you'll probably see a huge jump in performance after you iron that out. Next, Matt Paul says, great videos. You're too kind. What do you recommend to improve ankle mobility? Well, actually we have an ankle mobility video that I could probably pop up right about here, somewhere like that, to help you out with that. So I'd suggest check out that video. Next up is from Googly Woogly. I chose this one mostly because that was fun to say. Blisters! How can I stop having blisters? More of an exclamation rather than a question. But blisters are an unfortunate part of this because you're gonna get sweaty and you have to hold on to something repeatedly. A couple things that will help with that. Number one, make sure you're not death gripping the handle. The harder you squeeze the handle, and especially if you have an up or down movement of the elbow each stroke, you're creating friction every time the elbow drops up or down. So as you draw through, make sure that you draw the elbow through so that the wrist stays neutral because if you have any like drop, or if you are like changing grip constantly, that can often result in the blisters happening. So honestly, relaxing the grip is one of the first and the easiest ways to do that. Also sweat maintenance. So if you wanna wear sweat bands on your wrists, that can really help because then sweat doesn't roll down, the hands don't get damp because once the hands get damp, blisters are much more likely with increased friction. You can as well buy gloves. I've never used them. Some people choose to, and the options of gloves are abound. Some people, use gymnastics grips, some use mechanic gloves, some use actual rowing gloves, your choice on that. But over time, you will stop getting blisters, number one, because calluses will form. But number two, if you can just learn sweat management and grip management, that'll help. Next question comes from James Griffin. I'd love to find new ways to maintain my chest strength. I only have dumbbells up to 35 pounds, I have bands, but trying to find a way to maintain the size, strength as much as possible, because I don't have a bench or heavy weight. Maybe some ideas for upper body strength and stuff with limited equipment. Great question, James. One of the things that rowers suffer from the most is chest strength. There's no pushing that happens on this, this machine or with this movement. It's all pulling. You'll find that you generally have great pull strength, but the push strength definitely leaves something desired. Nobody has ever accused me of having a strong chest or a good bench press. With that being said, James, what I would encourage if you don't have a lot of equipment and you do maybe just have a set of dumbbells or bands are things that you can do with drop sets where you create high resistance early on, like banded dips. And you can do those you know, between two chairs. You can do banded dips up to a certain number, maybe eight to 10, then drop the band and do a burnout set with that. You can do that with push-ups as well, running the band around your shoulders so that you have resistance on that press and then drop the band and do a drop set. So all of these things are helpful. Same with the dumbbells up to 35 pounds. 35 pounds is decent. Slow the movement as well. More time under tension is a way to improve the impact of lighter weights if that's what you're dealing with. And then as well, just using the bands in a creative way, making sure that you do spend plenty of time on press strength because it's complementary to all the pulling that you get with rowing. Moving into that press strength can be something that balances the shoulders, the trunk, so that you don't just overdevelop into the pull, which again, definitely an issue for rowers. We overdevelop into the pull. Make sure that you're spending time on the press because it's good for balancing. Okay, next question is from 
Cyprian or Cyprian Kali. Thank you. I'm sorry on the name on that. I'm having difficulty choosing between a water, air, and magnetic rower. Which is the best for home fitness use, requires the least maintenance, and is the most durable? Ooh, that's a loaded question. Honestly, at the end of the day, the machine that's gonna be best for you is the one that best suits your environment. For example, water rowers tend to be much quieter than Concept 2. So if you live in an apartment where you know you have thin walls and floors and ceilings and you want to make sure that you are cushioning your neighbors from having to hear your workouts, then I might suggest a water rower. It has a more pleasant sound. It's a whoosh versus the just kind of mechanical sounding and loud sounding spin up of the flywheel on a Concept 2. Mag rowers tend to be very quiet because you just don't have the same flywheel sound and it's not as aggressive. That's from a sound perspective. You also ask, requires the least maintenance. Well, if you went with water rower, for example, you do have to deal with water in a contained system. Water generally is just not the kindest to mechanical instruments. So you're gonna deal with a little bit more maintenance there over time, having to clean the water, remove it, so on and so forth. Something like a Concept 2 is very easy on the maintenance scale because it's made out of primarily just bike parts, very, very simple parts. And if you ever have to work on it, replacement parts are dirt cheap because they're just, they're not highly specialized. They're very easy to come by and you can buy, Concept 2 doesn't try to make money on their replacement parts. And they're also very durable because of that. So there's not a lot of high tech in it. It's very simple parts. Then you have more of the high-tech machines like the Hydro or Techno Gym, which have a bit more of a tech touch to them. So that improves the environment. For example, if you love tech, then those are going to be more appealing to you. They're probably a little bit quieter because they're going to use a different system instead of that highly mechanical concept to noise that many of us are accustomed to. You look at Hydro, you look at Techno Gym, they're quieter. They've got more interesting stuff happening on the monitors, but that also means more tech equals more of a chance to break. So the evaluation standards are up to you and what's most important for you and where you live. Next, Josh Gould asks, whatever happened to Invictus? I'm gonna take this as what happened to me and Invictus. Invictus is still very much around, still doing their thing. And what happened in that relationship was I started my coaching career at Invictus. I started there in 2000, and nine as a member and in 2010 I started coaching. I coached with their seminar where we were traveling the world doing athletes camps up until 2017, maybe even 2018 was my last one. And what happened is just simply I reached a point where I wanted to start my own thing a la Dark Horse. It was just best for everybody if I was able to go do that on my own because I wasn't able to handle my full-time coaching schedule there anymore and I was filming and it just, it just got really challenging to be able to handle the workload that came with Dark Horse and being on the ground coaching for Invictus full-time and coaching for Concept2 and hosting their seminars. It was just too many balls in the air at once, which is why even though I stopped coaching at Invictus as a physical gym, I continued to coach with them on their seminar series. And so we would go and drop into Greece or Italy or wherever and put on a seminar for three days. I would handle the rowing portion as well as I was an assistant coach to all the other coaches as we went through. So honestly, what happened to Invictus is just that Dark Horse got big enough that I, and I was able to take a big enough platform that I was able to step out on my own. And then when we had a kid, it just was too hard for me to continue traveling. And so I wasn't able to continue to do the seminars with Invictus. So that's about it. Still have a good relationship with almost everybody there. And the gym is still rocking and rolling as far as I know. Ooh, okay. Really great question. This is from MR. What is the meaning of life? So it's actually a really interesting story. I'll just skip through the hard stuff, but basically there I am sitting next to the Dalai Lama. And at the end of it, there I am, tears in my eyes. Everybody around me is just absolutely enthralled. And frankly, I mean, it, it changed my life, so. Next, Alexander Bradley asks, what is your opinion on alternative arm movements, such as a curl or one arm to either side as a way to work different muscles? 100%. I am a massive advocate of anything that changes up the ordinary. That's why I love lifting odd objects. Sandbags are one of my favorite strength tools. Kegs are amazing, logs are amazing. Anything that you can do to be different and challenge your body in new and different ways, I am 100% for Alexander, so yes. My opinion is that I like alternative arm movements. I just like alternative movements in general. Finally, Jeremy Babcock asks, I have a Concept 2 and a resistance band. Not a lot to work with, but what would be a good workout routine while I'm stuck at home? Thanks. A great workout routine and one in which you're gonna be able to accomplish a lot with the Concept 2 and the band. 
would be all the live workouts that we've been doing lately, of which now we have a playlist. So make sure you go check out our playlist of live workouts where basically every single workout that I've done has been, can be equipment free or basically used as a band or a rower. You've got five weeks worth of hour long workouts, Jeremy. That is what I would be going back and watching. Guys, this has been a ton of fun actually answering your questions in real time here. So do me a favor, hit that subscribe button so that when I ask next time what questions you guys want answered, you are alerted and you can drop your question in there. And make sure you check out our playlist of our most recent live workouts so you get plenty of at-home workouts to follow.